Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, approximately uh, 4.05 p.m. and today is Wednesday, March 25th. This is the Town Council's Finance Committee. I want to welcome everyone. Um, for the record, uh, call to order. Um, just to note, we have all of our committee members present uh, for the record. I um, also want to welcome uh, Councilor Jean Marie Katarina, who has joined us, as well as Mike Shaw, our Public Works Director, Peter Crichton, our County Manager, uh, also a Scarborough resident, so welcome. Uh, Tom Hall, um, our town manager, and then we should be um, having and welcoming uh, uh, Neil Jamison, our county commissioner representing District 1, uh, joining us as well. Um, for those present, um, would I move a approval or take a motion to approve the minutes of February 25th, 2015? So moved. Second. All in favor? And uh, it's if you don't mind, Mr. Crichton, I, I, I do actually open it up for public comments, so if we can uh, maybe have you step back just a little bit so that we can invite anyone from the public if you'd like to get up and speak. Uh, you're welcome to get up and speak at this moment. If you can actually introduce yourself and uh, your, uh, where you live in Scarborough, that'd be great. But uh, you can go up to the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Fay. I live at 14 Mulberry Lane in Scarborough. I'm a resident and I do both. I uh, came primarily because I read the article in the Leader concerning trash modification and I have questions about it. I've already sent the letter to Sean and to Mike Shaw. I've gotten some of the answers, but it seems to me that all of this is going to do is make me pay $2 a bag or a dollar a bag instead of getting 80 bags for $4 at Shaw's. I put my garbage and I put my recyclables in bags right now and I put it inside the thing sells. I don't see why paying more money for the bag is going to help anything. If you're trying to change people's habits, this is not going to happen. I have no idea how you're going to police it if they're still picking up the garbage cans. If people are not using bags, garbage cans are going to go up in the air, dumped into the truck, who's going to see it? Nobody. Unless you're going to have a cop follow them around and charge people $2 when they do that. I just think this is a good way for you to make more money for the town without raising taxes. But I'm not totally keen about that. I can't write off the cost of garbage bags like I can write off my property tax. Basically, I'm against this, and I don't think it's a good move for the town. We've been doing well with the recycling, and uh, nobody's going to be 100%, but I don't think it's going to make any people recycle anything more than they already do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to get up and speak? Not seeing any. Um, thank you very much for the public comment. We will have uh, also public comment at the end of the meeting as well. So as you listen to the presentation and comments, you'll have an opportunity uh, to speak then. Um, so at this point, I'd like to actually uh, introduce uh, Tom Hall, who will do our introductions with uh, Mr. Crichton. Yes, um, we're certainly lucky and pleased to have Peter Crichton here with us today. Peter is the Longtime manager of Cumberland County, happens to be a proud resident of Scarborough as well. Um, Pete and, uh, Peter and I are certainly good friends and colleagues, and I very much respect the work he's doing on behalf of the county. And I think at the suggestion of uh, Chairman Maybine, we thought it'd be helpful just to get a bit more context about county government. Uh, I know Peter's constantly looking for innovative, innovative ways to provide further service to member communities. And I think we'll hear a bit more about that today. So without further ado, Peter. Thank you, Tom, for the comments, Mr. I Chairman. I should also mention he's a county boy, so uh, <laughs> a special place in my heart. And a former voice Peter. There you go. <laughs> Let's make sure we get all these comments. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. Commissioner Jameson will be here later. Uh, he's a, an attorney. He had to be in court today, and the judge was not going to let him off any sooner, so he will arrive as soon as he can. And I'm pleased to be able to be here. I was pleased when I received the invitation. The chairman is also uh, very familiar with the Cumberland County budget process. He served on our budget advisory committee. He was chairman of it at one point, and he's familiar with the Cumberland County government. So I have presentation I put together that is a mixture of, uh, I guess, education in terms of what we do as a county government and also uh, numbers in terms of the budget for 2015, which is our current fiscal year. Our fiscal year is calendar year uh, in contrast to the town of Scarborough with the other municipalities. 
municipalities, which are generally uh, July fiscal year, our fiscal year begins in January. So I will continue with the presentation. This is a, a diagram showing the different districts. There are five districts uh, for Cumberland County. The population of the county is over 280,000 people. We used to have three, and there was a county charter that was approved in November of 2010, which made a number of changes, one of which was it, it changed the number of commissioners from three to five, so it changed the configuration of the county. <coughs> Mr. Jameson is your commissioner. We are strongly committed to the principles of excellence, efficient government, and community involvement. Uh, that's a really important part of what we do. These are the guiding principles for the county commissioners, and myself, and the management team for the county. We have 13 departments in the county government. Many times people ask me what we do county government. We have uh, the executive office, uh, which is the office that uh, I'm a part of, the human resources office, uh, which provides services to over 400 employees. We have about 450 employees in the county government. We have information technology for IT, which is a very important part of what we do as an organization. We have uh, a communication center which obviously has technology. We have technology with the jail, technology with the law enforcement, and within the organization itself, um, with the district attorney's office and other departments that we have. Our facilities department uh, is responsible for over 400,000 square feet of buildings. Uh, we have the district attorney's office, which is uh, one of the largest, uh, I would say, law offices in the state of Maine. There are 17 assistant and the district attorney, and then we have support staff under state statute. The counties are responsible for providing support for the DA's office. So we fund the support staff. That's an agreement that was made many, many years ago, and it works quite well. The DA is Stephanie Anderson, and they do an, an excellent job. They handle 12,000 to 15,000 cases a year. It's not easy work, and they do it very well. The Sheriff's Office is our largest department of the county. We have patrol for law enforcement, which provides uh, law enforcement to municipalities who do not have their own police departments. Uh, there are, in this county, there are 15 communities that have police departments, uh, 28, including Pry Trial and has a constable. Uh, those are choices the communities make. <coughs> And we also do contracts with communities to provide them with police services in some cases. Like, for example, the town of Standish, which has a population of over 10,000 people. We are their police department. We've been doing that for 20 years or more. And it works quite well. We do a contract with them. We provide them with police services. In addition to uh, the communities that uh, we do not provide uh, those types of contracts to, so uh, our law enforcement folks are very busy. We have <coughs> also the Corrections Division, which is the Cumberland County Jail. We're the largest county jail in the state. And right now we're going through uh, an issue with the state legislature and the governor that you're probably all familiar with. I, I should say something about it. I'd be remiss if I didn't. Uh, governor LePage is trying to roll back the change that was made in 2008 when the state decided to create a board of corrections to oversee the 15 county regional jails in the state and to provide state funding for the county regional jails. What they did was they froze the assessment on the municipalities at that point in time, 2008. And since 2009 up till now, the state has provided the increased funding for the county regional jails in addition to whatever savings the jails can achieve and also any revenues that maybe they can generate through housing of federal inmates. We house about 50 to 60 federal inmates at our <coughs> which is really a very important part of our budget uh, that brings in over $2.6 million a year or so. That's really a critical part of what we do. And the people at the jail do a great job. Uh, I'm very proud of the employees that we have and the team that we have as a, as a county 
county government. Our jail was nationally accredited. Uh, we're the only one in the state that is. Then we have civil process, uh, which is the other division of the sheriff's office. And the sheriff's office does an excellent job. When a community decides to buy police services with the community, they're not just buying the uh, patrol deputy, they're buying the sheriff's office and all the support that goes with that. Then we have the Registry of Deeds. All of us who are familiar with uh, buying homes and refinancing homes are familiar with the Registry of Deeds, perhaps. Uh, we handle about 75,000 to 100,000 transactions a year, depending on the economy. Uh, right now, the economy is not going very well, unfortunately. That's my barometer for how, how things are going in the economy. Uh, I know Tom is probably looking at uh, what's happening with uh, you know, the revenues in terms of his budget, this is what I'm looking at uh, as, a, as a big indicator in terms of how things are going. <coughs> the Registry of Probate Office uh, handles a lot of family um, issues that, that are important to families, uh, such as uh, adoptions and uh, also uh, estate proceedings. They do a very good job. Over time, the, the state has seem to have much more of the responsibility on the probate offices around the state. We handle about a third of the probate offices statewide. And uh, again, our folks do a really good job. They have small staff. They bring in revenue. That's about a break-even operation in terms of what it costs us. <coughs> the Registry of Deeds, uh, they bring in more revenue than, than it costs us to operate the Registry of Deeds. The Emergency Management Agency, is the agency that works with the communities in terms of planning and preparation for storms. Uh, Mike will be familiar with the EMA. I'm sure he's worked a lot with Jim Budway and folks there. Uh, Jim mm -hmm. Budway is the head of it. He's also a Scarborough resident. Uh, he does a really good job and they have a small team of people and they are, are excellent. When we had the big uh, snowstorms this winter, they worked hard to try and gather information from the municipalities so that municipalities could get reimbursed for as, as much of the cost as possible through FEMA. And it was the folks at the EMA that, that uh, worked to try and make that happen. 50% of their budget is covered through main emergency management agency, so they get reimbursed for 50% of their cost. And then we have the Emergency Communication Center, which is our uh, Cumberland County Regional Communication Center. That's in Wyndham. If you know where the Wyndham Correctional Facility is, um, the Cumberland County Regional Communication Center is just across the road. We see the towers, and uh, we're providing dispatch and 911 service to uh, 19 municipalities out of 28 in Cumberland County. We have uh, expanded that a great deal over the last decade or more. We've saved the town of Gorm over $2 million since they joined the Regional Communication Center back in 2005. And we're saving communities collectively about a million dollars a year uh, that are participating in the partnership that we have. We have a, an advisory board. The chairman of the advisory board is the fire chief from Gorham, Bob Fever. And uh, I just went to a meeting the other day. Uh, it works very well. Uh, they're very dedicated to what they do. Uh, always been impressed with the dedication of the folks that participate. And they work through the issues uh, that they have to be able to establish policies that are beneficial to the communities and to the center. The finance office is um, headed by a professional finance director. The person who heads that is Alex Kimball. He's a former finance director for the town of Cumberland. He does a really good job. We're the first county government to hire a professional finance director back in 2001. Now I think uh, over half of the counties have professional finance directors. Our budget's over $40 million, so we certainly need to do that. He does an excellent job. He's doing a project now on analysis of the impact of the governor's budget for seven municipalities in the greater Portland area to try and help the, those municipalities to understand what the impact is to them so that we can better able, uh, be better able to uh, present the information to legislators and other key stakeholders on, on the impact to the communities. Our community development program is a program that has benefited uh, the town
town of Scarborough. That's a program that has been in existence for eight years. That is 100% federally funded. That program is headed up by a gentleman by the name of Aaron Shapiro. Uh, he does a great job. He is um, very capable. We have a municipal oversight committee that uh, oversees that program. Uh, your planner is the chair of that municipal oversight committee. Uh, sure. and Jay does a great job with that. And that community development program has brought in over $12 million to the region <coughs> and federal funding in the last eight years to help with a variety of projects. When Commissioner Jameson gets here, he can go through some of the projects that Scarborough has been funded for under that program. But that's a, another, what I call, value-added service that we try to provide to communities to provide more value in terms of the services we provide. The last department is our, our latest venture. It's a regional assessing program that we've established. We're providing regional assessing to four municipalities in Cumberland County. Those of you who have traveled outside of New England, if you go to other areas in the country, uh, assessing is typically done by counties, in some cases even by states. So the state of Washington does assess. So it's, it's unusual, actually, that municipalities are doing it. Uh, I've been involved in municipal and county government for about 30 years. Tom knows I spent about 12 years uh, for more in municipal government than I've been in this position for 17 years. What we're trying to do is, is provide assessing to the municipalities to do it in a, in a more uniform, equitable way, and also to, uh, in some cases, help communities be able to save money and provide quality service at the same time. Not every community is going to be able to achieve the same savings because it depends on what kind of structure you have. Um, and we'll continue to talk to municipalities that are interested about participating. And I, I feel very good about the program. I think that uh, this is going to be uh, a great benefit to the municipalities as, as we move forward in the future. Are there any questions at this point? What year did we, sorry, what, what year did they get rid of the treasurer? <laughs> um, the treasurer was turned no. out uh, this past year. But just uh, okay. when the, what happened is when the charter passed in November two thousand. She was elected again, re-elected for another term, so she had to finish out her term. Okay. Uh, she finished it out uh, at the end of last year. So at this point in time, the appointed treasurer is Alex Kimball, our finance director, and we have an appointed register of deeds instead of an elected register. Okay. Yes. Just, just a quick question. You said <clears throat> on emergency communications where some of the communities, sounds like they say significant revenue. Um, is that break even? I mean, oh, self-sustaining? On emergency communications? Yes. <coughs> no, it's not. Um, what we try to do is we try to capture the cost for the staff. When we work with the community, we have a formula that we follow, and we, we use that formula to charge the community for the staff that are needed to be able to answer the calls from that community. <coughs> and it's a, it's a national formula, and it doesn't capture the capital costs and some other costs, which we try to get grants for. For example, we just put up a tower. Uh, this past year was a two-year project, uh, and we got funding for about half of the cost of that through a federal grant. I mean, the reason I ask, and we'll come back to it, is if I look at the rest of your presentation, what you're yeah. asking for is an increase next year. It's right. pretty significant. I mean, everybody, so when you said town saves significant money, yeah. I'm just curious why we don't mm -hmm. charge the towns, if they're savings, what it really costs to provide that service, so the rest of the surrounding communities aren't subsidizing those towns, which is currently what's happening, what you just described. Yeah, it's happening to a certain extent. It's, it's an interesting question. Because we assess the municipalities, the community of Gorham, even though they have this contract with us for dispatch services. But you said they saved two and a half million. They've had it since 2005, and it's saved over $2 million. They're still being assessed a portion of the cost of, of assessing that. But, but but my point is, you know, they were spending $2 million more. And because they came on, they've got a, a rate that's lower than that. But right. all the other right. communities, other, right. even though they're paying in, right. all the other communities right. are paying in to subsidize that. Right. And I just, you know, when I look at a 6% increase when CPI yeah. is 2 or 3, right. just questioning why those towns would get a break in 
have everybody else pay for it, and whether that's something that can be looked at as a way to... It's a good question that's continually being looked at, actually. Uh, it's a delicate balance. And, it, and when I get into the budget numbers, I hope we can explain how we arrived at the increase that we, that we uh, had to do this past year. I had a, a similar question about uh, the charges for fleet services. Right. Uh, do you identify the cost of the fleet services for each individual community and then fully load those costs into the contract? We, we load the cost into the contract for having the personnel and the equipment to provide that contract. For example, in the case of Standish, uh, they have, I believe it's five and a half officers, and so they're being charged for those officers in, in addition to the benefits and, and their salary, also the vehicles other equipment, but they're not paying for the rest of the sheriff's office, <coughs> portion of the rest of the sheriff's office, <coughs> that service. But but the, the cost to run a police department out of the county mm -hmm. is not limited to those five and a half people. So they're getting police services that are being supported by dollars from all the other communities. To a certain extent they are. That's, and that's one of the, and that's how county governments are set up, is to be able to spread the costs out uh, across the county. And in this case, we're doing these contracts with municipalities because they've chosen not to have their own municipal police department have the county provide that service. And what we've done is we've designed contracts to pay for the police officers and the vehicles and the equipment for those police officers to do that work. Excuse me. To Bill's question, yep. that's in those communities who don't have their own police department are benefiting and are getting better services, so to speak, or more extended services than those of us who are paying. Well, I think that the, I, what I would say is that the services that we're providing are as, as good as they are in any municipal police department in, in the county in terms of the quality of the service that we provide and, and the police officers to do the work. What you're talking about is that the contracts that we have with those municipalities are being subsidized to some extent by other communities. What we try to do is we're charging them again, we're charging them again for the officers that are doing the work in their communities and the cruisers and the equipment to support them to do that. If they were not in those communities, we'd still have these other costs for the sheriff and for the captains and for the civil process division and these other other offices and, and individuals that are doing work for the sheriff's office. That's how we approach it. We still have those costs. What we're looking at is what are the costs that we need to charge a community in order to be able to provide them in their community. Mr. Crane, I, I actually I believe that uh, this is a conundrum every community faces because mm -hmm. it goes across the board at the state level as well as even in, to some extent at the local level because here we are, a community of this size. In fact, when I was looking at the population, <coughs> the third largest in Cumberland County, but yeah, we're losing a million dollars in um, EPS share from the state for our educational system and Cape Elizabeth is getting $500,000 more. So it's the, same, it's the same concept of redistribution so I, I appreciate that. What I do want to ask, um, before you get into the numbers, yep. um, who is our uh, budget advisory committee member that we can maybe express some of our concerns or comments towards uh, regarding the budget? Because that's our official, outside of the commissioner, that's our official <coughs> representative to the finance committee of the uh, right. commission. Actually, you don't have a, a budget advisory committee member right now for your area, so this would be a perfect opportunity to try and could do something that I tell to Mr. Jameson. Okay. Uh, if, if someone is interested, we'd love to have the participants. Does that person have to be an elected official? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just have one more question. Yes. I'm unaware of where the Cumberland, or rather where the county gets its, its funding. Is it primarily you assess the, the 28 communities? It's and, and, and okay. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Go ahead. Yep. And. Do, do you assess it by population or, or? It's really two factors, and I'll, I'll get 
into that later, but it's really two factors. Once the commissioners have, have um, had the budget review, and there's a process that we follow with a finance committee that reviews the budget, and the commissioners have adopted the budget, and let's say they adopt the budget, and it's a, for the sake of discussion, let's say it's a 3% tax increase, then what you have to do is you have to factor in what the valuation increase has been or decrease for each municipality under state law. In other words, did the town of Scarborough see an increased valuation? And if the town of Scarborough saw an increased valuation, then the tax increase will actually be more than 3%. If it was less, it will be lower than 3%. If that helps. And 65% of our revenue base comes from the property tax. For the now, county. You mentioned federal funding. So do you, do you factor that into your budgets as well? Or yes, that, you do. Yes. And you'll see that later on in the presentation. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Good questions. Yes. <clears throat> this is an example of some of the regional services. When people ask me what we are really good at billing, this is what we do. You know, we, we are really experts in terms of delivering regional services. I mentioned the emergency management office, and I've talked about just about everything that's on that slide. I did not mention the county hazmat response teams. We provide funding to support the county hazmat response teams, of which Scarborough is a participant. Scarborough participates with Gorm and some other communities in the Presumpscot uh, hazmat response team. Of course, we have the Cumberland County Civic Center, which provides entertainment region-wide, and you have regional assessing. And I've talked about all of these, so I won't belabor this point. I do want to say, though, that there are many hats that county governments wear nationwide. There are over 3,000 county governments in the United States with over a third. They cover more than 800 square miles. That's what our area is, roughly. So we're about 850 square miles. In many of those areas, they're doing everything from property assessment to public works to human services, economic development, education, to name a few. So there is more opportunity for municipalities to work with counties if they'd like to do that to try and reduce costs and still deliver the same quality services. I was president of the National Association of County Administrators for over two years, and that, that really opened my eyes in terms of what counties are doing elsewhere in the country. But having grown up in Aroostook County, I also recognize that people are very uh, I think loyal uh, to the municipal governments and to the local government structure that we have in Maine. And they're not as familiar with what the county governments are doing across the country. So I think that uh, there is an opportunity there for people if they want to look at delivering services differently. Mr. Craig? Yes, sir. Wouldn't you say that a lot of it um, depends on the population rather than the square miles? I mean, if you've got an awful lot of people in a small territory, the county can't provide as much information for them as the local municipality can. Uh, I came from New Jersey originally, as if you couldn't tell. And uh, basically, uh, I was in uh, Parsippany with a very large population, about the size of Scarborough. Right. Uh, and we were probably about 12 miles square. Right. Um, but the local government had to do it better than the Morris County government could because Morris County had could, just couldn't handle that many people in all the different towns. So local municipalities really were the go-to people as opposed to county. If you were in New Hampshire, they have one dispatch center that covers the whole state because they're spread out and they can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. You just don't have to give the personal touch, if you would, to all the people that Scarborough does. And I think I want to compliment Scarborough because I think they do a really good job, even though I object to a few things. But I mean, <laughs> the thing is, I think they do a really good job. It's, we've got, what, 18,213 people or something like that? Mm -hmm. Somebody died or was born, I don't know. <laughs> But um, I don't see how a county could possibly do a better job than they're doing. Well, I'm not going to stand up here and say I'm going to do a better job than Scarborough. <laughs> 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 he does not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I will say this, though. I mean, I, I think that municipal governments in Maine generally do a really good job. County governments in Maine generally do a really good job. There needs to be more discussion about how to deliver 
services more effectively and efficiently between municipalities and between municipalities and counties because we have limited resources in the state. I feel it's an obligation to look at what we can do to provide services. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that we can provide all the services that the town of Scarborough is to the citizens of Scarborough at the same level, the same quality, because I don't know that we can do that. But I do think that there's more that we can be doing to try and be of assistance to municipalities and to the citizens to be more responsive to the needs. And I just want to add, I mean, I've been around for a little while, and so I can share that in the 15 years I've been on the council, kind of off and on, of course, the town has looked at regionalizing and getting county services for communications. And I want to say this was a good 10 or 13 years ago when I first got involved with county government. And the council said no at that time based upon the value of the services and the value of our people that we have. And we are currently looking at assessing, regionalized assessing, rather than having it local. So we are looking at where it fits and where it doesn't fit. And I think that we're making good decisions based upon input that citizens give us as well as our professional staff. And you have a really good manager. We don't. This slide, I apologize, it's hard to read. I'm going to walk you through this. I don't know how many of you have a copy of this, but the jail represents 49% of the budget that the county is in right now for overall budget. It is a big cost center. It's almost $19 million for the jail. Lots of issues we're dealing with. I worked for the city of Lewiston before I took this job. I was the assistant city administrator. When we took over Bates Mill, we had lots of issues, almost on a daily basis. My boss, the city administrator, and I would talk to the finance director and other folks. We wondered how we were going to get through a day with everything that was going on. And I came here to the county and I thought, there's nothing that I'm going to face that's going to be any more difficult or challenging than Bates Mill. Well, I found it. The jail. Just think about it. There are 10,000 or 12,000 bookings a year in the jail. About 60 to 70 percent of the inmates are on psychotropic medications. We have huge issues regarding mental health and substance abuse. It's really challenging. I'm assuming that since the vast majority of the people who populate the jail don't come from Scarborough, that essentially Scarborough is paying for a more metropolitan area like Portland. I haven't looked at what the breakdown is recently. You don't charge. I'd love to have you charge per neighborhood. But I can understand how it's not possible to do that. But again, there's no question that there's a disproportionate burden that would fall to communities that have low crime rates and therefore have fewer inmates. It's another interesting question. About 30 percent to 35 percent of the inmates come from Portland. And then the Portland folks would dispute that because they say that there are many people that come to Portland because of the nonprofit centers that are there and shelters and so forth. So they track people from outside of Portland and unfortunately end up in the jail. And about 15 to 20 percent of the inmates come from the state. They're state inmates. So again, it's another example of where you have this countywide government that's providing services countywide and sharing the cost. We're very interested to know whether or not you're having unfunded obligations passed down to you from the state. Are these prisoners who are on their way out of the system to its parole or their sentences are less than a year? Therefore, I'm assuming that county jail applies the same rule here as I'm familiar with. That it's one year or less. You're in the county jail. Over a year, you're in state prison. It's nine months, actually. The sentence could change from six months to nine months. But what happens is in the sentencing process, sometimes that gets chopped up so that nine months becomes a year or two years. 
and we're trying to understand your burden part of this exercise is right. are, are, are you having it passed to you or is it just that uh, because this, I'm assuming this is one of the budget drivers. This is one of the things it costs. It isn't with this budget because the, remember the Board of Corrections that was created in 2008, they've been funding the increased costs for the jail, jails across the state up to this point in time. Right now, Governor LePage and the legislature are considering going back to the previous system prior to 2000, the beginning of 2009, when we assessed the municipalities for the increased costs. I was up there today at a work session prior to coming here. Uh, that's a big deal. That could, the worst case scenario for Cumberland County would be that $4.2 million of costs would be shifted from the state to the municipalities in Cumberland County for the Cumberland County Jail. Is that part of the governor's proposed budget? It is. Mm -hmm. And the governor right now is, is talking about providing funding for a short period of time to create a, what he calls a soft landing for the municipalities and the counties. And hopefully he does that. So, and that's, that's well, soft, soft for the municipalities and the counties. I mean, this is a, this is a big deal. We're working hard on it. And hopefully we're going to be successful. It's the same kind of, you know, issue that the municipalities are dealing with regarding revenue sharing and yeah. some of those other issues that, that you're directly facing. So thank you. I wanted to understand that better. Yeah. Now the rest of the sheriff's office is 17 percent. Keep in mind the sheriff's office is the largest department of public county. Mm -hmm. Then you have the communication center. You see that's 7 percent. Facilities is 5 percent. District Attorney, 4%. Again, we pay for the support staff. The state pays for the DA and the assistant DAs. Information technology is 2%. Debt service is 2%. Registry deeds is 2%. Executive is 2%. EMA, 2%. Registry of probate, 1%. Finance is 1%. HR is 1%. And then the others uh, add up to 2%. So that's a, a basic breakdown. This is um, where we start to get into the, the real meat and potatoes of, of the presentation in terms of the budget. And if you look at this, you can see right now we're in our FY15 budget, which began in January. So when the budget was approved last November by the commissioners, you had an expenditure increase for county expenses of 2.18%. Or in other words, an increase of $750,107. That had to do with um, the state retirement increase, which you faced as well, 20% uh, uh, increase on main state retirement. Health insurance increase, our health insurance went up over 10%. Uh, we made a change since then that should help the next time around. Uh, what we're doing is I don't know what you have here for health insurance program, but we have POSC, a plan for most of our employees under MMA. And then we also established another program that we're providing to employees on a voluntary basis. It's called a PPO 2500. And we've seen our premiums um, drop as a result of that. So I'm hopeful that next time around the insurance increases moderate. Traditionally, it has been uh, over the years, but we needed to make this change. I'm sure you've gone through the same kind of process. Uh, revenues, uh, we have non-tax revenues that we bring in, having to do with uh, police services that we're providing uh, uh, under the enterprise funds, I'm sorry. The revenues are the uh, registered deeds, uh, which is a lion's share of the revenues along with also probate and some of the other areas of the county. Then you have the, so go ahead. It looks like the typo on the uh, uh, variance column for revenues. I don't think it's a $56,155 change from fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 15. Looks like it's a $56. 
Now, if you look at the figure, a double negative. They're expecting a it's a double negative. loss. We went from, oh, yeah, it's going up. It went from ten million nine hundred twenty-seven thousand to ten million nine hundred eighty-two thousand. Okay. Yeah. The next category under surplus, we had a tax stabilization fund that we used to have as part of our budget, and we eliminated that in this budget. That cost three hundred fifty thousand dollars. The reason we did that is we are double A plus in terms of our bond rating. And we needed to protect our fund balance, and we needed to make that change uh, to be able to ensure that we're able to remain at AA plus. Uh, so that was quite a hit on the budget. Uh, if it wasn't for that, uh, we would have less of a tax increase. So you have the net county cost at 4.11 percent, and then you have the civic center. Because of the modernization of the Civic Center and the fact that we haven't reached a point yet where we're generating the new revenues that we are hopeful about, uh, we had an increase there of $316,300 uh, for 1.24%. So you take the 4.11 and 1.24, that gives you the 5.35%. Over the th last three years, the Civic Center cost has gone up by $1.7 million because of the bond for the modernization of the Civic Center, which I think in the long run is going to be a good thing. Uh, in the short run, it has been painful uh, financially. I think in the long run, uh, with the, the fact that we have a you know, modernized Civic Center, I don't know if you've been to it. How many of you had a chance to go? Raise your hand. Anybody here? You should go. Check it out. Um, we don't really have much. <laughs> I'd encourage you to go, and I think you'll be impressed. Now we brought on a private management firm called Global Spectrum, and I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. Now we have a board of trustees who are appointed by the commissioners. Under state law, the board of trustees really run the, the Civic Center. The commissioners don't really have a lot of say, nor do I, as the county manager, although I've got to hundreds uh, of Civic Center meetings over the years that participate and understand what's going on. And they do listen to what we have to say. The trustees uh, decide the budget. And then if they have a deficit or if they have capital needs, they, they pass that bill on to us, the county government. And you'll appreciate this. There's nothing that we can do about it uh, when they do that. Um, so we're trying to get through this. Um, hopefully, we're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel, so that it won't affect our upcoming budget as much as it has the last three years. Is Mr. Pratt still the chairman? He's no longer the chairman. He's still on the, on the board, and he's done a great job. Another Scarborough resident. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I call him Franklin Roosevelt. I think he was chairman of the board of trustees for 12 years. Yeah. Um, he did a great job. What do you give a crystal ball for fiscal year 16? Is it going to be the same type of increase? For us, we're kind of because we need to look at this rate, right? Whatever right. might have on the last right. six months of our. That's a really good question. We're not going to have to deal with the surplus issue, the tax stabilization fund, so, so that won't be an issue. Uh, that attributed to increase of three hundred fifty thousand, but it's current. The Civic Center is looking better. I, I think uh, that situation is. Wild card for us is the gym and for you guys. Mm -hmm. We're not able to. But which physical year was that? That it would affect FY16 for us, which begins in January. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that it is a wild card. I wish it wasn't uh, because the county and the municipalities have really benefited from uh, the changes that the state law back in 2008. Um, Mr. Craig, can you explain the budget segment? I whispered to him that. What's before us isn't actually what's being considered. This has actually already been assessed because the budget cycle does not compare equally to ours. Right. Yeah, again, ours is calendar year. So this budget was adopted last November. It's already in effect. And the, the budget process for FY16 for us hasn't started yet, but it will very soon. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. So you send us a bill, which we're obligated by law to just pay, right? Uh, and you do that in the fall of this.
coming year for your fiscal year ending uh, December 31, 2016. Now, Isaac had received it two weeks ago. Yeah. And the right. warrant came. It comes in the spring. It does come in the spring. The municipalities have a period of time in which they can, they can and wait until they pay 15. us. Budget? FY15. This is our FY15 budget. So when we set our tax rate for uh, our budget for 2016, we need to include the expense that the county will uh, impose upon us. So how do we do that? Well, he already has a number for your FY15. For your budget. We do. Uh, that's an excellent question. We do not uh, anticipate what's going to happen in the first six months of their next fiscal year, the last six months of ours. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but we've never been caught short either. So, Peter, we, we don't anticipate what's going to happen in your, in your next fiscal year. We budget based on the warrant that you just sent us two weeks ago. Right. And is there certainty in doing that way, or should we be budgeting? Well, I, we've, we've tried to be consistent for the last several years, as you know. Uh, so I think in terms of your, your budget you're working on now, mm -hmm. uh, that budget you're including in, in your budget numbers. Yes. Right? That 5.35% right. or yeah. whatever it is for the yeah. town of Scarborough. But the question is, should we be anticipating what happens in... Yeah, I, I, but but it's hard, I don't have a magic ball to be able to tell you what that's going to be. I would think that the tax in, that our next tax increase is going to be less than, less than that figure. But it depends on what happens in the jail issue. If the jail issue uh, doesn't end up the way that we would like at the legislature, then the, the number could be... Hmm. Uh, and we can explore that. Yeah, I'm missing something because yeah. we're never caught short. We don't get a supplemental. We, we're, we're not short in that regard. So there's. Yeah, you're already working on your 16. I see. Yeah. Our 15 is we're we're essentially depending how you look at it, we're we're ahead of you or we're behind you. Behind. I just want to mention for the record that I wanted to welcome uh, Commissioner Neil Jamison, who's joined us so uh, welcome, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you sir. very much. Uh, I'm just curious, yeah. as far as I know, and I think you know, but all the state and all the municipalities are on a fiscal year basis. Why isn't the county on a fiscal year basis? That's not necessarily true. Um, some towns are county year. Okay. And, and some counties are fiscal year. Uh, we've actually looked at changing to a fiscal year. I, I would think it would make it easier if you're all on the same sheet of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said you don't have a crystal ball, but you're asking them to have a crystal yeah. ball. Because <laughs> they got to guess what you're going to do and make preparations for it. Well, I think we, we've been pretty consistent in terms of what our increases are. That, that's probably how you project what you think. Yeah, the town fiscal... 15 is your fiscal 15. Correct. So, so that's the figure we would go for. Right. Right. And right. you're coming up with it before right. we even need it. Exactly. But aren't you, isn't the town on a cruel basis? Do you think? Isn't the town on a cruel basis? Shouldn't you be. So, I mean, it, it would be budgeted. I mean, our fiscal year 15, you would budget that figure, their 15 figure. But I, I hear you, but. So there is a section of the uh, budget proposal once it's been presented that we can delve a little bit deeper into both yeah. the fiscal year issue as well as how yeah. we pay that particular, if that's okay with part of the budget. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'd prefer. So to finish this slide, enterprise funds, those are the funds that we charge for the police services, the dispatch services, the assessing services. <laughs> Grants are the federal grants and state grants that we get. For example, the Community Development Grant Program, we received almost $1.5 million, roughly 15. That's where that money shows. So you can see at the bottom, the total budget is $42 million for the county for FY15. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
15 of the 28. Mr. Jameson will be looking at is a loose sheet. In fact, you probably have two of them up there. Um, Are they different? No. No, I just, I made copies, not knowing, not sure whether they had happened. organized 
that program in New England. Um, uh, we have uh, 24 of our 28 communities participating. We have received and distributed uh, some $12 million to our member communities that would join that. Scarborough has benefited as well in a number of projects. But this is one of the areas where collaboration between county government and the town of Scarborough or other, other county, other municipalities uh, certainly can help the taxpayer as well as uh, uh, certainly share the burden of certain needs that, that occur. So specifically, uh, $400,000 in projects in Scarborough since 2009 as a direct result of these uh, community uh, block uh, grant funds from HUD, which doesn't cost the, the taxpayers a dime, uh, but it benefits uh, a lot of different uh, <coughs> different types of projects in town. Um, and, I, and I would be remiss uh, if I didn't uh, say uh, great job during this, these, these last several years to the Town Council, the Finance Committee, and other uh, other players uh, for developing the uh, affordable housing project. And several of our uh, of our grants have been related to that. Uh, the, the C grant for planning in 2011, $10,000, helped feed directly um, to the planning of that so the proposal could be made. Uh, $80,000 for the construction of the initial sewer line uh, for the 13 unit housing subdivision. Uh, and we approved yesterday at our uh, oversight committee the $119,000 grant that is pending, and, and we anticipate we will get that funding from HUD when the money comes in in June and July, uh, which will be the completion of the sewer extension line. Uh, so those, you know, you add up those two pro three projects alone, it's one project, but those three grants alone, that's $200,000. The Scarborough grant uh, benefited, and this uh, specific project wouldn't, uh, may not have happened, uh, but it was a good way to partnership. Uh, another area is twin. In the 2007 to 2014, we have this housing uh, rehabilitation project that uh, is through our whole CDBG program. And 26 home, complete home repairs of heating systems were accomplished for the uh, total of $26,157. So that's, uh, uh, that's another instance where um, we have partnered uh, through uh, working with the town and our grant program to provide service that. Four complete housing rehabilitation units um, to the tune of fifty-six thousand dollars happened in 2011 to 2013. Um, the Pine Point improvements uh, back in 2009 to eighty-five thousand dollars to the road, the sidewalk, the storm drainage. Any of you that have been down that way know that that uh, uh, <coughs> that whole uh, pedestrian safety safety area has been uh, badly improved, and that was part of it. The town obviously has invested uh, a great deal in that as well. Um, one of the programs, I think, countywide that uh, ne necessary is uh, overlooked um, is our, uh, our violence intervention uh, program. Faye Libby, who is our violence intervention director, um, is, a, is a national leader in um, putting together domestic violence programs. Uh, they've been recognized as a model on uh, obtaining federal grant funds to do that. Scarborough has benefited uh, as a member of community uh, during these last three years uh, and over a thousand clients in the program. Every year, Faye has to uh, go out with her chin comp and, and, and get money from uh, not just our program, the CDBG program, but other federal 
opportunity to work with Scar uh, Scarborough as a partner um, on this level and on any other level. Uh, and uh, I don't know if Peter had an opportunity to talk to you, but we are we have other ventures going on, um, uh, including this ethics venture, uh, including the communications uh, system, uh, which the state of the town for two million dollars. Um, so uh, we are out there, and it's, and it's, it's, it's a great town. Over 2.4 million. I don't know what the exact number. Yes, currently. And that $400,000 here is just from the community block development grant. Right. Just kind of contextually. Sure. Yeah, and frankly, our access to the CDBG funds, um, though there may be some other means, but uh, Cumberland County provides the means for us. Uh, there are four communities in the county that are so-called entitlement communities that can make application directly to HUD for funding. And it has to do with their demographic and socioeconomic makeup. Um, the county steps in in our place, if you will, because we're not eligible to go directly to HUD, receives an allotment from HUD, and then there's a competitive grant process or application process to distribute those funds across the county. And we've been, as just mentioned, uh, aggressive and successful and certainly appreciative of, of fairing pretty well through that process. I mean, $209,000 alone is related to the uh, Habitat yes. project, so that's absolutely incredible, incredible effort on our, on our to identify that, but so it's good to yep. Anything else? Questions? Thank, Thank you very you much, much. sir. Uh, very important, so I want to thank both um, Mr. Crichton and Mr. Jameson for being here. Um, um, and uh, the one takeaway I have on this, um, while I will not probably step forward, is that I did hear that we need a uh, potential recruit to serve on the Budget Advisory Committee since District 1 is not represented. So um, I'll definitely uh, plug, plug that for you both. It's a pretty incredible experience having served both on the committee for a couple of terms and then also serving as chair, so. Just, just in that regard, what is the commitment? It would, it would be meeting over the fall of the year, is that right? Yeah, just so people appreciate when that happens. Typically what happens is the finance committee will convene in September, probably toward the middle of September, at the end of September. And then the finance committee will probably meet in a half dozen times or so um, during the, the process. It's not as long as it used to be with the council of the It wasn't because of me. The good news is that doesn't coincide with our budget yeah. review process, so there's some separation there. How many members of the advisory committee? Well, we have we have nine positions, ten positions, right, on the ten positions on the finance committee. Two from each of the commissioners. And I know uh, Peter's offered in the past, and perhaps we should take him up. They often go on the road and present their budget and have their meetings around the county. We can certainly yeah. play host to one of those, so we can participate, and our residents can hear. Good. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, item number six, um, is the discussion on pay as you throw. Um, before we open this uh, conversation up, I, I, I want to be clear about uh, kind of um, the procedure or the protocol uh, on why this is even an agenda item. So there's always been some kind of uh, question for as many years as I've been involved about how do certain initiatives within the town get presented. Uh, sometimes it's uh, hidden within the budget and then it goes to the committee and so when I first ran uh, this has been something actually pay as you throw has been presented several times to the council over the last couple of years and felt that it really needed to have a more vocal and more public 
a process to the presentation and not just simply something that's entered into the budget and then we go through the budget process and we've had um, I know of at least one presentation that I've been able to go through and I'm not sure what happened to be prior to that um, and um, that is available um, online that meeting I believe was taped so you can see um, Mr. Shar and Mr. Hall as well as Work Zero I can't remember the gentleman's name. Waste Zero. Waste Zero, sorry. Waste Zero's presentation regarding the program which is at a very high level. Um, the purpose of this is to provide some public direction around whether or not the Finance Committee wishes the manager to present that as part of the budget um, and, and which it doesn't necessarily, does not mean that it is an approval to be included because we will then evaluate the program financially as well as aesthetically as part of the regular budget deliberations um, at our level and then we make a formal commitment or a um, disapproval and then send it to the full council for their full review because we have to keep in mind that we only represent a minority of the full council so the three of us may be unanimously in agreement of the program or disagreement but yet the other four may be in the opposite of our particular situation so I'm not advocating whether it should be approved or not approved this is simply to give the public direction so that we can receive input uh, publicly from all the citizens which we have I've received quite a few um, so I just wanted to be able to then open up this discussion and then provide it to the manager so that we can then move forward so that um, it's transparent I guess is the best way to kind of move that forward so uh, with that I, I open it up to the, my co-counselors here about the discussion I guess I could make a couple of comments, or, or do you want to reflect yourselves first? Uh, um, if, if we can reflect, so I can please. kind of get a picture of where we're going, because then yep. I can, I might be able to shape something with my own comments, um, but I, I kind of want to listen. I'd rather hear from you first. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, Ryan, as you framed it up, um, as the, should we do the due diligence and do some of the work and get the information, I think I would agree absolutely we should do that. My question is similar, I think, to the council on it would, would just be, yeah, there were some numbers put out about the potential savings. Just to make sure you guys, we do some due diligence to make sure we're comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is I think as we head into the budget season, this community is going to have some real tough choices and some trade-offs. We're probably facing, as you've heard here, we know there may be some things coming at, at, the, at the county level. We certainly know there's some things coming at the school level. We already know about a million dollar less funding than we've had this year. So I think as a community, we're going to have to decide how we want to spend resources and how we want to do it. So I think it's, it's due diligence on our part to, to look at it, get the information. So my big question, I think, would be echo what I've heard from others. Is there really savings here? And what are we talking about? So I, Sean, I'd be, as you had framed it up, be absolutely 
with that, it actually kind of coincides a little bit with my perspective as well. Um, I actually came, I, I want to ask, um, I want to move it forward for the discussion purposes um, and do the due diligence, and I want to ask really for two types of analysis to be presented as part of the conversation going forward. First is that I think before you make any new initiative or change in an initiative, you need to do a uh, lessons learned or look back at the prior initiative. So the prior initiative here is the roadside recycling program that was initiated, I think, in 2007. And to look at the timeline of, of the cost analysis, or I would actually probably call this more of a cost avoidance analysis about what did we save as a result of the roadside recycling, both from a tonnage perspective, because what we did is we shifted from burnable general waste into recyclables, which is least costly. It's not free, but it is least costly. Um, so what was the cost avoidance for that? But also, if you can include into that um, the additional cost, I know that there were two different phases. The first was, and I believe this is a rough number, about $750,000 back in 07 for the rollout. And then there was an additional rollout regarding the, the, the tagging of the um, containers. And I know that there's been some change in analysis regarding the useful life, useful life of the original equipment. So if you take that all into consideration and do that analysis for us and then present it, and I think that um, so that's regarding the old program, uh, or I should say it's not an old program because then in my understanding it's an existing program that will continue in addition to the bag. That's right. But then also look at what is the cost analysis for the new program, uh, which would then tie into the implementation. How are we going to educate, who is going to help us educate, and what is the timeline for the rollout if it is something that we approve. And I think that we need some very specific and clear information regarding that for the citizens to understand it in advance so that we can get proper feedback and full feedback from them. Uh, and then we really look at um, multiple stagings of that. So as an example, we know that I believe the cost of the bags uh, actually is, um, I don't know, something less than 50 cents, I believe. So what if we phased this out and did a slow rollout as well as phase it out with a lower price for the bag? I know that Wade Zero presented it with an estimate $2 bag. So what if it's less than that? Um, and then is there the, still the benefit of it? The last piece that I want to ask for is more of an individual analysis. The reason why I support this is that I think that, one, we have a responsibility to look at all non-property tax-based revenue sources. Um, that really does, I think, promote greater recycling. There's a lot of work to do that, but there is greater recycling, and that is the goal because I'm hoping that no one has to buy a bag because they will recycle more. Secondarily is that what is our long-term plan or strategy with that revenue because we have some long-term debt that are associated with solid waste and particularly, um, you know, we're talking about an eco-main that there could be future assessments related to 17 to $20 million worth of capital expenditures that we have a big share in, as well as the landfill closure that's scheduled, I want to say, in 10 to 15 years, 10 to 12 years. So there's a cost to us related to that that we've never saved for, and I think that this type of revenue source should pay directly for something like that so it doesn't go into the tax base. So I'd like to understand if we can get some numbers. I know it's very hard because they haven't really started planning for it, but if we can get some estimates from EcoMain relating to that, that would be incredibly helpful for at least my own position in understanding yeah, it. On the last point, I'm not sure. We need to know that for right. all sorts of reasons. I'm not even sure if we'll get to that. I, my goal would be to cover the curbside program through a user fee-based system. I think that uh, we'll be lucky to attain that goal, frankly, much less be able to fund other solid waste-related costs down the road. But regardless, we need to identify those and understand them and, and come up with a plan. To the extent that you can, I would appreciate it. So I wanted to put up, I mean, does that, does that eat um, what you would ask for regarding implementation and programs, and does that meet what you kind of in that summary of what I requested? Sure. Is there anything that you want to add to that analysis? Just, I, I it will become a public document to share, and I want to include everything I can. Yeah, I, I just want to get comfortable with, from the presentation, there were some pretty significant projections of how much more we can recycle. Yep. So I just want to make sure, I mean, you, those are critical assumptions, mm -hmm. so just making sure we, we're really comfortable with the projections we're doing and maybe be a bit conservative in those projections so we can really determine what the financial liability of it is and, and make a you know a value proposition to our constituents about why we're doing it and why does it make sense. I, I even went so far in our first meeting with Waste Zero to ask if they would guarantee
guarantee a certain recycling rate, and they didn't say no. So I, I think there is a high degree of confidence. Um, Mike and I have done some of that due diligence in talking to other towns, and we'll do more. But I, my gut tells me from the, the diligence I've done so far is that that 44, 45 percent is well within reach. So I we're at 30 or 32? 36 at this point. 36. Yeah. Um, Why does the number vary, Tom? I, I heard him say we're at 32.5. Is that right? I thought it was 36. So it, we're, I, I thought it was 32. Let's pull it out. I'll let Mike answer that. I use the expert. Well, I mean, and, and that's with a, with a, with a uh, essentially a voluntary system. We, we peaked at 38% in 2008. That was the first full year of, of this rollout. Um, and, and then since then, we've backslid a little bit. We've been consistently at 32 and a half, which is actually better than some of the other communities around us that have a, a similar system. So that's the good news. Um, you know, just a, a comment beyond that is that, you know, uh, if, if with, with all the with all the fewer, with all with all the interest around that curbside program in 2008, we ended up at 36% on a voluntary basis. Um, it's safe to say that if we could ever get back to that 36%, that would be the extent of what we could could realistically expect on a voluntary basis, and that's probably not that likely. So, just a comment which, on my part. Which, if I remember right, is still above what was originally projected because I thought we only projected 25% participation. So we are doing well. Yes. It's just that in the current market, we need to do better yeah. um, because of the cost of both recycling, which is the price of uh, recyclables is down, and the cost of uh, burning waste is higher. So, um, so with that, I, I'm comfortable in suggesting that Tom include it and move it forward, and we can go through that kind of discussion and thorough analysis once it is presented as part of the budget to us as a committee before it goes to the full council. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, picking up on Peter's, use realistic uh, assumptions to create a model of what we would expect this to do as far as a budget impact. Uh, because we've got good data to, to judge it on. We know what we are doing. We know what Waste Zero says they have as an average for their large range of communities that participate. So I would think we should be able to make the case for this is, and obviously you have to charge the bag, so if you didn't charge much for the bag, the program is clearly not going to stand on its own. So what, what are these other communities charge for bags? That's part of that knowledge that you know, so many questions have come at us as we've kind of uh, opened this up a little, but people go, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, Tom, you've heard comments that were shared today, and I'll be happy to share all the emails that I've received so that you can field also the questions that have been asked and some of the citizens' concern about, you know, how is it going to be policed or how is it managed from an enforcement perspective to, you know, there's perceptions that we're going to have bags sitting on the side of the road that will be ripped apart by animals and run over by traffic. So I will be happy to give you the five or six that I have. And if I you think can I incorporate have. that into we'll your that. analysis, and if you gentlemen received anything, um, as well as any other town councilors are welcome to uh, provide that, if, if that's okay with you, Tom. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking that, so this evaluation will be done in the month, next month, in the month of April. Well, it, it's... If, if this is the group, it's going to be equally time-consuming on you. I think Mike and I can probably push through some of that due diligence piece. Uh, but if it's in the budget, we are kind of committing to it. Um, I would at the very least suggest a delayed start date and not, not push this to July 1. I think there needs to be a lot more conversation. And it strikes me, whether it's Waste Zero or someone else, one of the things that Waste Zero brings to the table is that they've done this in, what, 400 communities. And so they, the rollout is something that they specialize in. That's part of what you buy. Did, did they say they prefer a 90-day rollout? Yes. That takes us to basically a rollout in September or October, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, if I you push hard, you could probably do September, July 1. But all that matters in terms of how, what you book in the, in the budget. Right. So okay. I, I'm just foreshadowing uh, what I'm likely to do by w way of recommendations, delay that start date to allow us time for further discussion and sure. and education on it. But it's going to make for a busy month um, with I finance committee. Said, I said, if we could achieve the uh, improvements in the budget and not diminish the quality of the program, then I think given the difficulties we're facing with the budgets, is something that has to be considered. So getting it into this budget.
budget seems to me to at least force us to do the work. Well, it certainly does. It forces the issue. I'm so pleased that this conversation is at this level. Mike and I have kicked it around for every year I've been here. I mean, this is the newest municipal service we've provided, uh, and it's interestingly, uniquely, one that's ready-made for user fee systems. Um, and so we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is this is done and it's tried and true elsewhere. So I, I, I think all the questions and concerns um, there are responses for, and, and we need to go through that process. And in that regard, uh, is the uh, waste zero presentation that was made to us that handout available uh, for the public? I, I, I'll check, but I believe it was part of the finance committee materials, and therefore it would be. But we can we can make it even more accessible I've read it by. A couple times since, because it is a lot to absorb. Yes. Uh, well, and so uh, I only mention it because it does permit members of the public, members of the press, to be able to get a higher level of knowledge. Yeah. Since we're all kind of moving yeah. forward rapidly with the idea of is this a viable idea or not? We'll elevate it and give it a place of prominence in the. Yeah on the home page so people can find it easily. I may want to follow up directly with you yep. just to make sure I'm getting the points of your analysis. And I definitely think that other members of the town council will probably, when we do review it at the finance committee, that they'll want to be educating themselves at the same time. It's, a, it's, it's, it's new, it's big, uh, it's consequential, and it affects everybody in town, and everyone has a point of view on it. So, And, and one hand, it would be great to have the conversation outside of the budget process because that's one of the aspects. But to me, that's two or three down the list of why we should be talking about this. But to your point, uh, there's no better time than to talk about it because of the trade-offs. Um, this is a this is an option that needs to be and considered. And up on what, what Sean has from the beginning said, let's look at budget drivers. You know, we shouldn't be counting pencils. We should be looking at the things that will make a difference to the outcome. So, um, it's uh, actually uh, folded nicely into item number seven, which is future agenda items, dates, and times. I do want to mention for the public that regarding this particular issue, on Wednesday, April 22nd, starting at 5 o'clock, the Public Works Department will be presenting their budget. Um, so, that would be a time. Um, we haven't discussed yet how we're going to kind of uh, hold those meetings and, and whether or not, um, usually it's a session where the Finance Committee listens to town and we have questions directly. Um, because of the sensitivity of this issue, I, I would be inclined, unless other councils tell me not to, that we will have some public comments to be able to hear from them, um, maybe at the end of the meeting, so that they can hear the full discussion and our conversation around that. But we'll, we'll provide that opportunity. So April 22nd at 5 o'clock is the presentation of Public Works. It's from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, just to go over the calendar, uh, Right now, we have currently um, basically have scheduled every Wednesday uh, in the month of April uh, for a finance committee meeting outside of the first and then also the 20, no, the first and what was the other? No, it is actually the 22nd, right? What are the two dates in April? First and 13? Uh, I'm sorry, two dates for, for regular, a regular town council meeting. First and 15. All right. So every other Wednesday, except for those two dates, um, we actually have um, meetings, including a, it looks like it's one Tuesday. Yes. So April 8th, um, starting at 4 p.m. through 5.45, 6 o'clock, we have public safety, police, fire, EMS. Uh, we also have planning, finance, and etc. 
processing, and this will be available online, by the way, on Tuesday, April 14th, also starting at 4 o'clock. Um, um, the, the, uh, the biggest discussion we'll have around the largest portion of our budget is first with the school department, um, and then the library, uh, Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, and the administration. And then Wednesday, April 22nd, starting at 4 o'clock, we have community services, then MIS and Public Works, wrapping that up uh, starting at 5 to 6. All of those meetings are pretty much between 4 and 6 p.m. And then we will have um, at least, um, and there's some conversation uh, we talked about in our joint session yesterday, but on April 29th, uh, we will have our final review really as a um, town council slash school board as individual members um, or potentially as a public hearing. Um, we have a public budget forum that we will be presenting at the high school starting at 7 o'clock p.m. At the, in the gymnasium. Um, that's our opportunity to give a macro level um, presentation of the budget and then really open it up for Q&A for citizens to ask uh, town council members, uh, the finance chairs, as well as our staff will be there to help support answering the questions around the, some of the more details because I'm sure they'll get into the weeds pretty fast about specific programs and allocations. Uh, and uh, But keep in mind that this does not necessarily coincide directly with the town council's public hearings and other meetings that they have regarding the budget because they go through their own readings as well as you'll hear. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, so I'll keep an eye out for that on the web. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, I've received requests for three different items for future. I think uh, we probably won't take this up until after the budget season unless you guys really want a lot of work. Um, the three items that have been asked for consideration is really around debt management and bonding and how we go through that planning process and really how do we identify um, what gets to put onto a one year, three year, five year, 15, and then what are the terms and, um, terms and rates of those bonds. Um, I've also, if I remember correctly, Mr. Hall, I received a, um, an email regarding both the audit and the attorney contracts. Uh, by charter, we're supposed to review, or maybe policy, we're supposed to review certain contracts on a periodic basis um, and potentially go out for an RFP and bidding mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Um, and so we will need to sit down and talk about what is required for the charter and for our policy to be in compliance for the new, the next fiscal year. Because right. that's what it would start for. So, um, if there are other items, um, I'll wait to plan that once we get through the uh, budget process. If that's okay, and if you have any recommendations, um, please bring them up. Uh, and then we'll have at that time. We've really not focused on financial statements because we're getting into the budget. You know, an actual financial performance review. Um, and I did want to mention. I forgot the date. Um, the audit review is April first. Yes. At four o'clock. 6 p.m. 6 p.m., excuse me. Before the council meeting. Uh, which is a very important process and, and responsibility. We have our chance to see how fiscally sound our have policies and staff are. So um, that will start. And that's actually a joint workshop run by uh, Chairwoman uh, Holbrook. Holbrook. And it will be also be with the school board being present as well as the right. accountants. Yep. That's right. Anything else? Yes, sir. I, I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, the upcoming schedule obviously is a lot of department discussion. I know last year uh, uh, the town manager did an analysis of uh, all of the new hires, expanded proposed new hires, and I just wanted to bring up that I thought that was helpful, and, and I'll, I'll say that I like the way the schedule reflects the fact that a final review of recommendations doesn't actually take place until April 29th. In other words, we hear presentations made on April 8th, 14th, 22nd, and, and how do you prioritize uh, uh, projects and uh, ex uh, things that people want to do? We've got departments that are working hard at things and, and suggesting that they may need new personnel mm -hmm. or uh, IT services or whatnot, and it's impossible to say at the beginning, oh, I'll support that because you don't know if a week from then you're going to support something else, but that you can't support both in your own mind at least because of the fiscal restraint that you want to impose on the process. So I, I bring that up, yes. Tom, so that we could at least put it on the table. Yeah, 
I am doing a new budget format, but as part of that, I'll provide a separate uh, appendix or exhibit, if you will, that will highlight and, and pinpoint the new uh, proposed new hires and provide some context and justification for those. Uh, so and that will be part of your uh, presentation. It'll be part of the budget document, yes. Document. And then uh, certainly you can take it up in detail with department heads as they appear before you. Oh. Believe me, they'll make it a priority of their comments. Yes. Anything else regarding dates, agenda items? Uh, I'm not seeing any. I'd like to open it up to uh, the floor to public comment. If anybody from the public would like to speak, you're welcome to go to the podium and speak. Yep. Okay, Nothing? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? The record is 4.37 p.m. Five. Oh, sorry, five. I can't see that far away.